Thanks for watching this week's sermon. We hope that it can speak to you and impact your life and faith. If God has used this ministry to impact your life in any way, we are always encouraged to hear your story. You can write to us at stories at rcfministries.net. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy today's message. So here's a problem I have this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about this thing called the Colossians hymn uh, as we are in the book of Colossians still and we are at verses 15 through uh, 23 is the specific verses that we're on. I'll review very, very fast and I'll begin the process of laying some foundations to get to where we need to go. My problem this morning is I don't, do not want to overwhelm you or overload you with information, so I just want to give you just a bite size, just enough to chew on. Is that fair? Is that all? Okay, just enough to chew on so you don't sit there and say, uh, this is too heavy, this is too whatever. I want you to understand some important things that I'm going to lay out before you because by the time we get to chapter 2, this is all going to make a lot of sense. So you have to understand this stuff that we're going to talk about this morning. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus at the center. Come on, one more time. Say, Jesus at the center. My sermon notes for today are there. So if you have a U version of the Bible, you can go there. And uh, we're going to be doing this every week. You can search on, I think it's called Christocentric. And you can download the notes and everything is there. You can write, do whatever you need to do to kind of get to where we need to go. So you can kind of track with us, okay? Um, let me review briefly from uh, last week on what we talked about. Two things that I shared with you after we did all the introduction stuff with the scripture. Um, the gospel points to the hope that's stored up in heaven, and it enables believers to express their faith in Christ and their love for others. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that he did for us. We saw Paul thanking God for the faith that these believers at Colossians have, for the love they had for these others, but it was all based on the hope of what Christ had done for them. The second thing we saw is that the believers were to be filled with the knowledge of God. This is the part that I am going to go into a little bit because um, my problem is I don't know God like that. Anybody else in here or is it just me? Or we think we have him figured out, okay? That's my problem. I don't know him like that. And so it's all centered on the redemptive work. Um, by the end of this series, I want us to really understand what the redemptive works uh, of God, which was done through his beloved son so that we can, see the phrase right here? Live lives worthy of the gospel we have received, okay? Let me tell you what that means, and then we'll kind of walk through it. How I conduct myself in the earth realm right now is not reflection, a reflection, or an accurate reflection of the grace and gratitude, I mean, the gratitude I should have to God for the grace he bestowed on me. You know, I'm put it this way. If you're in a marital relationship, men, you can appreciate this. We do the best we can to show our wives that we love them, and they look at us and say, is that it? <laughs> Come on, y'all, right? You know what I mean? It's like we can't do enough. And so I kind of feel that the way I live my life is not a life worthy of the gospel, but I want to give God more. Anybody in here want to give God more? So when he looks at me, I want him to say, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I want him to say that. I want him to say that's what I'm talking about. So if I'm going to live a life worthy of the gospel, I must understand what he did for me on that cross of Calvary. So uh, this is why I want us to talk about uh, what we're going to talk about this morning. Come on, say Christocentric. Say it again, say Christocentric. And don't nobody in here steal my stuff. Okay. Um, the t-shirt is coming out. We're going to have a good time. And so I want to talk about this whole thing called the Colossians hymn. Now, as I talk about this, First big word I want to put on the screen, and I'll kind of walk you through some stuff before we get to the text. Colossians, um, I'm going to compare it to Philippians chapter 2. It's probably one of the deepest books um, in the New Testament as it deals with a good Christology. Okay, and what I mean by that, a good study of who Jesus really is. Okay, um, I think you and I humanistically speaking, we can't fathom this because all we know is a concept of order, okay? God at the top, Jesus in the middle, and we put the Holy Spirit on the bottom somewhere. We have a problem putting them all on the same plane. Come on, y'all talk to me. 
Are you with me? So, so, so the, the, here's how we live this out theologically and philosophically in our life. The big G's up here, the Jesus is in the middle, and the Holy Spirit is whatever. And so when we get filled with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit enters our lives, we don't see that as God living in us. You kind of get what I'm saying? And then when we accept Christ in our life as personal Lord and Savior, we don't see it as the vehicle where God really entered our lives. A matter of fact, here's the deeper part, and I'll talk about this in a little while, is that what happened on Calvary, we really don't know who's on that cross. Can we talk about that? We really don't know who's on that cross. And so as a result, we live our lives funny. So I just need to kind of share some things. And I'm going to be, I'm not going to be too, too long. I just want to kind of point some stuff up. So cosmologically, what that means is that, uh, which is the study of the Christ, the, the cosmos or the world or the angelic realm. I'll kind of hit that a little bit. Christ is not simply the agent of creation. That's the part that jacks me up. But the goal of creation, all things were created by and for him. If you can think about it, it's all about Christ. If you can think about it. The problem is I mess it up, and I'm going to bring you in there with me. The problem is you mess it up. Don't say go by yourself, preacher. Y'all come with me, <laughs> okay? I want us to talk about it. So come on, say cosmologically. Say that. And, and, and these notes are out there, but write them down. We're going to flesh it out a little bit, okay? Here's another crazy one. Um, before I even pronounce it, um, Soterius has more to do with the doctrine of salvation, okay? Um, it has to do everything with your salvation and the fact that I'm saved. So here's what this say. If I were to say it in English, it would be salvifically or soteriologically, the climax of God's act in history is not located in the creation of the physical world, but man, look at that. Lord have mercy. This is crazy, okay? All that Genesis stuff, in the beginning God created. Everything that happens that we encounter and see is to point us to Calvary. Golly! Because that's where God came and did it for you and did it for me. So it's all about him. Are you with me? Is this making sense? Very, very important. Very, very important that we kind of walk through this to get to where we need to go. I want you all to see this with me. Okay. Now, here's the other one. Ontologically, and that has to do with the nature of being of a person, it is unprecedented to be able to identify a historical figure with the preexistent son. I'm going to explain that. Jesus is the son in whom the full deity there ain't nobody else on the face of the earth that you can look at and say, there goes God. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> when you see Jesus, you say, oh, there's God right there. Nobody else in history, Buddha, Mohammed, oh, talk to me. Come on, y'all. All, all, I mean, Harry Krishna, none of them, none of them, none of them, none of them, none of them. Jesus is the only one that we can find the full deity of Christ. And then here, I like this, in terms of revelation, Jesus becomes the one and final revelation of the invisible God. As such, he fulfills the law of the Torah in giving us access to God. Nobody else is going to be another Christ. Does that make sense, guys? Repeat after me. Say, Jesus is it. Jesus. Say it again. Say, Jesus is it. So here's what we're going to study this morning as best as we can, and I'm just going to hit a couple of verses because I want you to walk out with one thing today, then tomorrow I'm going to, not tomorrow, uh, Wednesday I'm going to flesh that out a little bit. Um, next Sunday we're going to give you the other part of that, then the following Sunday we're going to put all three together. So it's going to take me three weeks to preach just these, what, six verses or something like that. Here's what I want you all to understand, the big idea. Christ, the agent and goal of God's creative act, reconciles all things through his death on the cross and presents believers acceptable to God if they stand in the gospel. Okay? One more time, Christ, the agent and goal of God's redemptive act, reconciles all things through his death on the cross and presents us acceptable to God if they stand firm on the gospel. In English, I don't deserve to be in the presence of God. Jesus went to the cross, paid the price for my sins. So when I accept him into my life, 
God can look at me and I can be sinless. Are you with me? Declares me righteous in his presence because of what God did, what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. So I don't have to try to be good. I just accept Christ and my love for him presses me to be good. Oh, come on, come on. A lot of us are working to be saved. You'll never get there. <laughs> You'll never get there, okay? Give me two minutes to pray. Let's read a scripture and let me share these things with you. Lord, open our hearts this morning. Um, give us patience, God. Give us patience to hear and to know what you would have us to know, God. So open our hearts to receive. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. Bring to remembrance, God, the things that I've ingested as we shared. So we open our hearts to you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. So go with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. I'm going to read all the way to verse 23. And for the next three weeks, we're going to still be in this block of Scripture. Every week, I'll give you a little bit of the time. Okay. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Listen to what it says in verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1. Well, let me give you context. Back up to, um, back up to verse uh, 11. Let me see here. Yeah. Yeah, verse 11. Say amen if you're in verse 11. And I'm going to move quick. Okay, it says here, May you be strengthened with all power according to the glorious might for all endurance and patience and joy, giving thanks to the Father. Come on, say Father. Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance with the saints in light. Look at verse 13. And we're going to hit this two weeks from now. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Okay? So God did some thing for us through his son. Now look at verse 15. It begins by saying, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, verse 17, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. I can't hear, oh, you just want to hoop right there, you know. Uh, that is, <laughs> in everything, he might be preeminent. Come on, say preeminent. Yeah, look at verse 19. For in him, the fullness of God, Jesus, I can't wait to get to that, um, was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Verse 21, and you, that means me. Come on, say, and me. Amen. Come on, say it again. Say, and me. Amen. Who was once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Jesus, I like that. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you or to present me holy and blameless and above reproach. Lord, have mercy. If indeed we continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which he has proclaimed in all creation under heaven. And here's what Paul says. When I got that, I announced my call. <laughs> he said, yeah, he said, of which I have become a minister. And here's how Israel took that. And Israel said this, nothing else matter. He said, nothing in this world will do. He says, Jesus, you're the center. And it all revolves around you because he got a full understanding of the knowledge of God. And I'm trying to say to us this morning, church, when we get this, going to Malawi, doing missions, all that stuff, it's not going to be an issue because Jesus will be at the center. And our response is going to be him first and not us. Are you, come on, say amen if you're here. Are you guys with me? So I want to walk through this. I want to walk through this. So once again, Christ, the agent and goal of God's redemptive creative act, he reconciles all things. And I'm going to hit that word, all things. This is why I need you to come Wednesday through his death on the cross and presents believers acceptable to God, it says, if they stand firm in the gospel. Okay. So first thing I want you to walk away with today is that Christ is supreme over the cosmic realm. Yeah, yeah. That's all I want you to know today. That's all I want you to know today. Uh, I'm going to flesh this out. I can't go too far, but I want you to know he's supreme over the cosmic realm. Repeat after me. Say, Christ is supreme over the cosmic realm. One more time. Say, Christ is supreme over the cosmic realm. 
Uh, now, I need you to believe that. Don't say that if you don't believe it, and we're going to flesh it out scripturally in a little while, because if you understand that, let me jump to application. The struggle that you have right now, we'd be able to give it to him, and it won't impact us no more. Okay? The reason we can give in to the things of the world is because we really don't believe that he's supreme over the cosmic realm, and we give the devil credit for what he ought not have credit for. Okay? Here's why I need you to come Wednesday. I'm going to say it again. We create these things that we ought not do, and we're the guilty parties, not the devil. He can't make you do jack. <laughs> I want y'all to hear me. Okay? Being tempted is not sin. Yielding to. Yielding to temptation is a sin. So number one, here's what supreme means, okay? It's a state of condition of being superior to all others in authority, power, and status. And I am not talking about Diana Ross and her backup group. Okay? <laughs> Some of y'all missed that. Y'all too young. Um, <laughs> supremacy of Christ means that he is superior, okay, over all, anything that exists. Let me stick with the cosmic realm. I'll flesh that out in a little while. In the cosmic realm, he has all authority. He has all power. He has all status. And so it's almost as if it's like this. It's Jesus, then everything else. Are you with me? Now, let me get ahead of myself. So everything else underneath is subject to the master. Oh, I wish I had two people in here that could lock into that. Are you with me? Come on, track with me. I want y'all to get this, okay? So as we kind of walk through this, I want to kind of take you through this. So um, let me see here, make sure I'm doing this right. Is it Okay, good. So number one, he's supreme over the cosmic realm. Say it with me. Say Christ is supreme, Christ is supreme. over the cosmic realm. Look with me at verse 15 of uh, chapter 1. And there's several words in that scripture, in that verse, that I'm going to take my time to elaborate with you, and then we're going to pick up in verse 18 next week, okay? It begins by saying in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible what? So he is the image of the what? Invisible what? Now look at the screen real quick. Image can be, when we hear the word image, it can be deceiving from our English perspective. And let me go here because I'm going to show you this in Scripture. If the enemy can keep us defining image through our lens, we really won't know who Christ is. Come on. Are you with me? And if he can keep you thinking he is this, when he's not this, he's really that. <laughs> He'll have us in subjection, okay? So it's the Greek word icon, and what it means, it's an object that has been formed to resemble a person, a god, an animal, likeness, or image. I'm going to go to Genesis in a little while. Now, here is how we define the little thing. We will take, I wish I had, I, 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 I wrestled all week to have a good illustration. Here's the best I can do. You guys ever seen the little, the little Buddha dolls with the big belly? Okay. Here's what we'll do. Um, we'll say that that doll is Buddha's image. You kind of get what I'm saying? That's our humanistic translation. And so we will attach a definition to image to this thing that has the shape, um, the form, the curves, the belly, all that stuff, and say that thing is in the image of, of, of Buddha, and then here's how we'll define it. He looks like Buddha. Are you with me? But, but here's the thing you need to know. The image is not Buddha. So you can't use that human definition to really understand what it means. When we use the term image in biblical ter terms, we're talking the very essence of who God is, okay? He is God himself. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. Let's do this. Go with me to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, um, verse 27. And I need to show you this because we're going to pick this up 
on Wednesday when we come back to this. I want to show you a difference here, and uh, I want you to see this real quick. Genesis 1 and 27, um, well, back up to 26. Okay, back up to 26. And then let's kind of talk about this and, and hit this. Okay, you guys are there? If you're in Revelation, you went the wrong way. So, yeah, kind of. Your other left, yeah. Okay. 26, listen to what it says. Then God said, let us make man in our image, and what's the other word? After our likeness, okay? And then let them have dominion over the what? Fish and over the what? Sea, the, the sea, sea and over the birds of the heavens and over all the livestock and over all the earth and over all creeping things. Where? On the earth. Now look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Something just struck me. Go back to verse 36. Uh, 26, I'm sorry. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps where? On the earth. Okay. So, so dominion. So, so let me tell you what that word image there in the New Testament. The image says that there's certain features, certain character traits, certain things that belong to God that he transferred to us to give us capacity to be able to respond to his grace. Does that make sense? Okay. Image there does not mean that we are God. Let's be clear about that. Let's, 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 come on, talk to me, guys. Are you with me? So you having the image of God doesn't mean that you are God because some people have mistakenly fooled themselves into thinking that, okay? It just means that there's certain capacity of reason, of function, of certain things that God has transferred to you to allow you to respond to him salvifically other than the monkey. The monkey can't accept Christ in his life as personal Lord and Savior and be saved, but you can Come on, that's what image bearers are, okay? Come on, are you deep with me? Now, now and because the image, having the image of God connects to the fact that we have capacity to respond to God. Now, this is free, and this is why this has come up again. Every person alive on the face of the earth is an image bearer. Even the person you like that you can't stand the most ridiculous person on the face of the earth, the, the, the worst criminal, they still possess the image of God, and what that means is that there are redemptive qualities in them. Let me go here. Even the most demon-possessed person on the face of the earth still possess the image of God within them, so there's redemptive qualities, okay? Now, this is free, and I'm going to move on. What I like about the image of God is that when God put his image in us, he didn't attach color to the image. <laughs> yeah, so when I look at you, I ought to be connected to the image that's in you, not the external, because the external is not the real you. It's what's on the, yeah. Come on, does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Now, let me show you a couple more scriptures, and then we're going to move on. I want you all to see this real quick. Now, look at this scripture. Here's what it says in Hebrews about Christ. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And look at how the writer of Hebrews says, the exact imprint of his nature. So, Jesus is not like the little Buddha doll now, we can say, oh, he looks like God. No, 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 no. The exact imprint is he is the very essence of who God is, okay? Very, very important. Now, if you go back to Colossians, and we're going to hit that in a little while. Uh, well, let me, let me wait till I get that. I want y'all to see it. Come on, say amen if you're with, with me. Look at Corinthians, okay? Let me stop at the, where it says, the God, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the mind of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is what? Here's what Satan does. If he can keep you from seeing who Jesus really is, he can keep you sinning. And because we think he looks like God, and we don't know him to be God, we keep sinning. Does this make sense? 
And we, we stay in this trap because his goal is to keep us there. Let me show you this, this scripture real quick. Look at this one. This is a lot of, let me read this. Here's what Jesus himself said about himself. John, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Isn't it? How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else, if you can't handle that, just look at what I'm doing. <laughs> Here's how this happened. Context. Jesus was hanging out with his disciples. And he's always talking about, I don't do nothing but the Father. What the Father says. If the Father says, heal, I heal. If the Father says, save, I save. If the Father says, feed, I feed. And here's his disciples. Okay, you keep talking a lot about the Father. How can we get to see him? <laughs> now, imagine the disciples. Come on, man. You're Jesus. You're not God. And he's like. Oh, come on, dude. You know you're not Jesus because you eat with us and you hang out with us and we don't see you. And, and as much as I hate to say it, that's your problem and that's my problem. Are you with me? We see Jesus and we view him as if he's not God. And the sad commentary is we live our lives and treat us as if he is not. But he is the exact image. Come on, say Jesus is God. Jesus. Say it again. Say Jesus is God. I want you all to track with me. So he is supreme over the cosmos. That means he is God. Go back to Colossians real quick. I want you to show you this other thing. Colossians uh, chapter 1. We're still there. Let me show you the first thing. Ah. He is the exact image of the invisible God. Look at the next phrase. He is the what? Firstborn of all what? Man, that's, that's like a heavy phrase right there. Let me just explain this real quick. And, and I, I, I want to, the firstborn, let me tell you what, the firstborn pertaining to existing prior, okay, to something else, existing first, I like that phrase, existing when? Existing before all creation or existing before anything was created, it is possible to understand firstborn, just like we says, as superior status. So, don't make this mistake. Well, in the beginning, God existed. Then God made Jesus. And then God made the Holy Spirit. <laughs> don't make that mistake, okay? Because if he existed before creation, that means he was not created. Come on, say amen with me, guys. I know this is rough. I want you all to wrestle with me, okay? That's the whole premise of everything that I'm trying to get you to share here to understand. Now, let me talk a little bit about that word first, firstborn, okay? Firstborn is, is a word of authority, um, not necessarily only position. Here's what you think. Um, Derek has a firstborn son. I have a firstborn son. Um, and in, in my humanistic term, I'll say to him, because he's firstborn, he came out first. Okay, and in a sense, um, it, it has a word, it has meaning that's attached to it to say only um, priority or it's a temporal term. But in this sense, firstborn is a term of authority. Come on, say authority. Okay, here's the reason I'm saying that. Y'all know the story of Jacob and Esau, right? Okay, and, 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 and if you understand this, what I'm saying to you, Esau was the firstborn, right? But who got the birthright? Yeah, you kind of get the idea, okay? The same thing with David. David was the youngest of Jesse's son. Yet when you read Scripture, listen to how it refers to those 12 guys, guys by way of authority. David was the firstborn. Has nothing to do with coming out first, but has everything to do with the election of God, the authority of God, and who God decides is going to do what he wants done. The same thing with the nation of Israel. Lock into this. Don't fool yourself into thinking that God created the earth and then he created the Israelites and so they're the firstborn. There were probably nations that existed before them. But it's an issue of choice. Now, let me help you all in case you fall asleep on me. 
The fact that God calls you and he calls me his firstborn doesn't mean that we were the first somebody to come on the scene, but it means all the more that in spite of every person on the face of the earth, he chose you and he chose me. Come on, I wish I had somebody in here. It is a word of authority saying that he means something. Come on, say firstborn. Say it again, say firstborn. Here's what it means. Firstborn is used as a legal term to refer to one who, who uh, is a heir of the father's inheritance. And as heir, this person also inherits the what? Power, the authority of the father over his household. The title firstborn therefore points to the unique and incomparable, incomparable identity of Christ. Go back to the top one. As heir, this person also inherits the power and authority of the father over his household. Y'all yeah, give me two minutes to play with this. When I came to Christ, the deep folk noticed, I became a joint heir with Christ. Y'all have heard that before. Are you with me? So what that means is not that I am Christ, please nobody mistake me, not that I am God, I'm not saying none of that, but I share in the power and the authority that my father has over his household. Are you guys with me? Okay. So, so, so check. Let me give you a couple of applications and I'm going to move on really, really quick because I want to hit the other two. In my house, Tony ain't in here, right? Okay, good. Yeah. I'm the man of my house. I got to say it real soft. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she might be listening. Okay, good. Yeah. Y'all know how it goes. Amen. Y'all be talking about, I know you're not. She is. Yeah. But in my house, in my house, that's where I say y'all. Yeah, I'm the man in my house. <laughs> so, so that means, that means, that means, don't nothing go on in my house? Well, sometimes. Yeah, don't, 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 don't nothing happen that I'm not, come on, are you with me? I mean, I run everything in my house. I, I do. I run everything. The dishwasher, the vacuum, the, the, you know, the, I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, but I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. Now, now the point, the point that I'm making is this, is that unless I give another person in my house authority, they don't share in my authority. Okay? Now, let me jump to application really quick. A lot of us have fooled ourselves into thinking that Christ only has authority over the earth realm. His house is bigger than the earth. His house includes the cosmic realm that we're talking about. And if he's Lord over the cosmic realm and we share authority with God, there is nothing in the cosmic realm. I wish I had somebody in here that ought to have authority over us because we are joint heirs with Christ. Oh, this is going to make sense in a little while. Come on. Come on. Is this settling in in your spirit? Come on, say amen if it's getting there. I want you. Let me move. Come on, say he, he's the image of God. Say it again. Say he's the image of God. He's the firstborn. And then look at this third one. This is the part that messes me up. He, verse 16, look at verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And it says, all things were created through him and for him. You guys see that? Let me read that one more time. Because I'm, I'm done. I, I want to share one more thing. This is all I want to give you today. This is, this is the part that's got me messed up. In him, all things were created. It doesn't matter whether it's in heaven, the cosmos, or on the earth. Whether you can see it or whether you can't see it. Whether it's thrones or dominions or rulers or, or authorities, they're all created, and watch this, through him. And what? That, that messes me up. That messes me up because let me just give you this real quick. That word thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities has everything to do with angelology or just, well, let me, let me translate it this way. In, in Ephesians chapter 6, it says we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but, but what? 
principalities and powers and you see the same litany or the same enumerated list. That's the point I'm trying to say. So it's talking about that, that he created all that stuff that we fight against, whether good or bad. Okay, this is going to mess you up in a little while. And he is in control of all of that, okay? So let me, let me, let me do this. Bear with me. Let me get cranial just a little while. So all things were created by Christ. And then I have the phrase, air is passive. I'll explain that. All things were created through and for Christ. And I have there the perfect tense. Let me explain. Give me a minute. This is why I need you to come Wednesday. In Genesis 1, it opens up by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, okay? And what we're seeing in Colossians, the agent through which God created is Christ, okay? The aorist tense has no respect of time. So what the aorist says, at some point in time, creation happened, okay? The passive voice says, creation didn't create itself, but whenever the passive is silent, it's saying God or his son Christ is the agent through which creation happened, okay? So if I were to read the first part that says, look at, look at verse with me, verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, and then look at the word again, they were all created through him, and for him, the second use of the word creation. Come on, say perfect tense. Perfect. Say it again, say perfect tense. Perfect. Listen to this really, really quick. And this is why I said I don't want to go too far. This is going to jack you up. The perfect tense says, an event happened in the past, but it has ongoing results that is still happening today. That's what the perfect tense says. Okay, this is going to really mess you up, so I need you all to come back. And so the focus of the perfect tense is not so much the action in the past, but it's the action that happens today. If I want to focus on the past, I would just use the heiress. You kind of get what I'm saying? At some point that happened. The perfect says God spoke and creation began and the perfect says, things are still being created today. You guys are deep. Because you're thinking God is still doing the creation today. I'm thinking you are. And I'm thinking I am. <laughs> but he's still in control. Okay, because let me, let me hit the next one, then I'm going to come back to it. And I'm wrestling with this theologically, so y'all give me a little bit of grace on this. Okay, because in Christ, all things are what? Come on, he's what? Say it again. In Christ, all things are what? So look at what verse 7, he is before all, and in him all things are held together. Let me stop here. So let me tell you what that means. And I got to come down here to say this, because man, I am wrestling with this. I am wrestling with this. I am wrestling with this. So you guys grace me as I kind of wrestle with this so I don't mess up theologically. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, and then he placed his image in man, right? So what's deep about this image bearer that we are is that the animal world, the perfect tense doesn't apply to. In a way it does, in a way it does not, okay? Um, but we have the ability to kind of be like God, I'm not saying be God, in a certain sense. Are you with me? So when we exercise our image-bearing ability, we produce, well, the design of God is that we exercise our God-given ability to create good things that look like God, right? Because creation is still happening. You kind of get what I'm saying? But what the enemy does is if he can get you to be like him, and use your creative ability to create things that don't look like God, he wins. But verse 17 says, it doesn't matter what you create, when God gets sick of it, he'll stop you from creating anymore. 
<laughs> I know I'm messing y'all up. Let me give you some examples. So there's first order creation. This is my stuff that I'm, Robert, I'm going to develop this out, and I think I'm on to something. There's first order creation, and then there's second order creation. Here's what first order creation looks like. A purebred dog. Not mixed with nothing. God made all the purebred dogs on the face of the earth. Here's what second order creation look like that's still happening today. Is that a man comes on the scene. He takes two purebred dogs that's not designed to breed together. And he puts them together and out comes a second order creation. And so you got this funny looking thing y'all call a chihuahua or whatever. Little body, but a head this big. <laughs> you guys are tracking with me. Okay, let me, let, me, let me go one more step. There's fruits that God created that are first order creation. Are you with me? And then man comes on the scene and he says, what will happen if we take this fruit and take that fruit and we, here's the word we use, graft them together and we end up with what we call a second order creation or a fruit that's the result of the grafted thing, okay? Um, you guys get what I'm saying? Let me give you one you can really identify with. God made male, and he made female. First order creations. <laughs> the intent is never that two males experiment And try to re... I wish I had... Come on, are you with me? And recreate because that's not the design. The same thing with two females. Let me go on and on. Are you guys make, get, getting what I'm saying? Okay? So now, now, now check this out. Let, let, let me go here. And I'm going to flesh this out Wednesday. Go with... Don't go. Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 6. Here's what happened. God created man and put him on the earth. And Genesis chapter 6 comes on the scene. And it says... Um, the sons of God saw the daughters of men look good, and they came down, and they intermarried. And my words, a bunch of second-order creation happened. So here's what God said. You know what? This is some sick stuff. That's not my design. Give me my eraser. I'm going to erase it all, and I'm going to start over again. Are you with me? Because all the second order creation that we did, he says, I'm sick of this stuff. And he wiped them all. But before he rubbed the erasers, hey, Noah, yeah. you my first order man because you're just doing it the way I want it done. Wow. And he found grace in Noah's. Are you with me? So he took Noah and his family and he says, first order creation only, okay? So here's what we're going to do. Go back to my first order. Take two of every kind. Don't bring none of that half-breed stuff up in here, up in here, up in here. Are you with me? Just my first order stuff. Come on, y'all talk to me. And, 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 and I'm going to erase everything on the face of the earth. And, and then I'm going to start over again. <sighs> my salvation, I'm not done yet, is about God erasing all my second order creation <laughs> and give me a chance to do it again. But because I don't understand the concept, I'm saved, but I'm still creating. And it's second order creation. Are you with me? Because he gives us choice, he gives us options, and as opposed to us replicating things that are only of God, we replicate things that are not of God. Is this making sense, guys? Wednesday, I'm going to talk about that Garden of Eden. Hey, don't touch that tree. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Okay? Here's the beauty of it all. Calvary and grace is all about him giving you and him giving me a chance to make it right. Come on, that, that's just the surface version of it. Now, here's the beauty of verse 17. So when he finished with Noah in um, Genesis chapter 6, he says, Never again 
Will I wipe out the earth with a flood? So whenever you see my rainbow in heaven, that's a sign that I'm going to stick with my word. So the only reason you and I are getting away with second order creation stuff is because God is going to remain true to his word. So here's how verse 17 says, he upholds it all by his hand. Are you with me? Because he's given you time, and he's given me time to get it right. He's given you time, and he's given me time to change our minds to get it right. He's given you time, and he's given me time to change our minds to get it right. So he is the sustainer of the cosmic realm. So here's what he does with us stupid people. When we come to him, he drops a hedge. Here's what Satan where you been? I've been roaming forth. Have you considered Job? Yeah, but you got a hedge. He's sustaining. In the midst of our foolishness, he's sustaining. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. In the midst of our sin, he's sustaining because he upholds it all. If we get that and we get Calvary, here's what I'm going to say. We're going to start creating the right things because we do have ability to create. And my good day. So here's how God says it. My spirit will not always strive with men for all the desires of his heart are wicked. So people, let me stop because the Bronco is about to come on. <laughs> Listen. God wants us to love him. If we understand, let me, are you guys in control? Or is, I mean, can y'all put the last slide or is it just me? Can y'all do that? I want to stop here. Good. They're still in control. He is Lord of the cosmic world. Listen to this. Demons are subject to him. No need to concern yourself with the demonic realm. As real as they are, Jesus is supreme over them. Yeah. Listen to this. Believers should live the victorious, victorious Christian life. Let me, let me put this together like this. I'm the man of my house. God is the man of his house. Christ is the man of his house. Christ being supreme over the demonic realm or the cosmos meaning. <sighs> Listen to how I'm going to say this because I'm fleshing this out. When Satan comes to you and I'm guaranteeing you that booger's going to show up. I'm guaranteeing you that. You ain't all that. If he had nerve to come to the first Adam in all his holy and righteousness, you better get your act together. Well, let me, let me go ahead and throw me in there. We better get our act together. So when, here's the importance of that application. When he comes, and here's how you can come. <laughs> Did God really say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Be careful how you respond. Because it's a setup for you to create the wrong thing. You guys are tracking with me? Because what you do next dictates what you really know about Christ. If it was Jesus and he showed up like that, rolling several million deep, like the kids would say, because his angels are there. I ain't got that one, so I don't need two, two demons on him because he ain't nothing. This one, I just put a half a demon on him. <laughs> that one right there, yeah, I need legion because she got some word up in her. Okay? So be careful how you respond. If I'm you, now knowing what I know now, here's how my response is. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> nope, I ain't got time for that. You better go on. And when he comes back with something else, well, it is written, hey, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, you <laughs> sneaky little demon, you. <laughs> Are you with me? Be careful how you respond. If you're dumb enough to say, well, let me see, did God really say? <laughs> and then you're teeter-tottering. It's got you. You're going to create the wrong thing. The beauty of that, God's eyes are still on you. And that's the grace of the New Testament. And he still sustains. And he still loves. But let's stop creating the wrong things. Okay? The beauty of what I'm sharing with you today, since he's Lord over the cosmos, you don't have to. When we do do it, it's because we want to, not because we have to. If you know Christ, you're in control because you're in God's house and you're a joint heir with Christ. The beauty of this hymn. You kind of get what I'm saying? The beauty of this hymn. Literary context. So this is why Paul said to the church at Colossae, you don't have to give in to angel worship. You don't have to give in to all this stuff. You just need to know who Jesus is. If he's at the center of your life, you're going to make it. Amen. Bow your heads with me. Lord, you create the invisible and the invisible things. Perfect tense says creation still happens today. The issue is who's creating and what is being created. Is it for your glory or is it a fight against your kingdom? So God, speak to every person in here today. Touch every heart. Let us evaluate, God, what we're doing in the lab. Let us evaluate it. Because we can't appreciate reconciliation until we understand cosmologically what you're in charge of, ontologically who you are, soteriologically what you've done for us, and by way of revelation, who you really are. Continue to show us. Continue to show us. Thanks again for watching this week's sermon. If this is your first time watching one of our RCF sermons, we encourage you to find a church to get connected to, whether that's here at RCF or a local church around you. If you want to hear more sermons from RCF, you can do so by subscribing to our iTunes podcast or by visiting our website. At our website, you can also donate to this ministry online to help support this ministry in impacting and reaching the world. You can also follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram to stay up to date with what's happening here at RCF.